believe this. It looks like my family. So it's like scroll and sequence because I like, smell like. It's about time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, IOP seminar. I'm Chen Xie, and I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Bradley because he's on my committee, and uh, we all get here uh, in 2020. All right. So, uh, just a formal introduction. Dr. Neon's lab studies plant reproduction and cell differentiation with the ultimate goal to expand what is possible in plant breeding and genetics. He applies a combination of experimental and computational genomics, open innovating the techniques to answer new biological questions. Dr. Neon has earned his PhD in biophysics from Harvard University under the guidance of Dr. Wayne Lenzer. He subsequently pursued his postdoc with Dr. Virginia Wobot at Stanford University, where he was the first to apply single cell RNA-seq in any plant species other than Arabidopsis. He is the recipient of an NSF Graduate Research Fellowship, NSF Postdoc Fellowship in Biology, and NIH Mira Award. Please join me to welcome Dr. Brad Leons. I'm really excited to share with you, and I've tried to, um, Emphasize even talking a little bit about my graduate work, the way that bioinformatics has consistently empowered a lot of what I do. So it's kind of fun because I've not really given this particular talk before. So I had a draft title. This is going to hurt. Got acknowledged for being recorded. <laughs> I had an initial title of genomics and bioinformatics strategies to empower self aid for programming to emphasize the fact that I'm talking a lot about computation. And one of my students had a really good suggestion to just take off bioinformatics on this because genomics is not separate from that. It's really core. The experiment and the library prep and the analysis all go hand in hand to the awesome power that these new technologies enable us. And that's a lot of where my work and my lab's work has benefited from being able to be involved both in the, the wet lab and the dry lab in what we're doing. And I think I'm most known as an experimental biologist, but I am also a, a bioinformatician. And I wanted to first just kind of share briefly a couple of ways that I've used bioinformatics in my graduate school before moving on to postdoc and into plants. You know, my first paper is actually a bioinformatics method. I have a R bioconductor package for this, and the goal was really to figure out what genes are expressed in different cell types. You know, single cell RNA seq has really been a powerful method to take this experimentally a lot further. And part of what I developed was a, a way to deal with this computationally. We have huge amounts of data available to us. And for many cell types, you often might know one or two marker genes that are used to define them. And so the simple idea is that we compare all this published data and look for cases where you have other genes that are tightly correlated with a known marker because the proportion of different cell types varies by sample prep, tissue, all kinds of different parameters. You can then infer what else might be expressed in that cell type using data that we already have. And this uh, general approach had been uh, attempted before and methods have been developed and they generally were using machine learning, which is incredibly powerful. But the challenge with machine learning with this problem is it's only as good as your training set and one of the, the best methods had done tons of technical innovation to make machine learning work with only training sets of 40 or 50 genes and down to even only 10 genes. But anyone here who studies a cell type, give me your 10 marker genes that are all only expressed in that cell and nothing else. And it just doesn't fit what we know about the biology a lot. And so we came up with different ways to deal with the challenge of combining together many different data sets from different labs so that we could still use only a single marker gene, which was often much more, more realistic. And here's just a precision recall curve, just comparing our method to the most state-of-the-art machine learning one on the exact cell type that they focused on. And you can see that we do as well as their best with their huge number of query genes, but with only one. And that's made this possible to use on quite a much larger number of types of cells. Another project, I was involved in a collaboration to understand a type of um, neural supportive cell in the gut called enteric glia. And so there's many different cell types in the nervous system. 
These are basically all the non-neurons nervous tissue in the gut, and we don't know a lot about what they do. And so my collaborator had figured out ways to specifically isolate these from mouse. And part of the project was using RNA-seq to try to see, well, what do they express? What do they look like? In the field, a lot of the arguments had tried to understand these by analogy to a better understood cell type. So there was the camp that kind of viewed these as being most like Schwann cells because they share a developmental origin. And another group that said, well, if you look at them, they look quite a lot like astrocytes. So maybe they're just astrocytes in another location. And I did the RNA-seq analysis for this project, but also had some more challenging type of um, questions because what we ultimately wanted to do is compare this to many other cell types, which my collaborator had not isolated. And so what we did is actually use available data. There at the time was a really widely used and great microarray data set from mouse that specifically isolated neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and many different cell types in the brain. There had been a good one from human that used RNA-seq after isolating the similar proportions, but we have very different library preps, different species here, wasn't done the same way. And so coming up with a good way where we could compare between data sets was a challenge. And it was basically fairly simple what we came up with, but really focusing on where are the biological signals. And so first, instead of trying to think about absolute expression values, which will vary just by platform quite a bit, we focused on full changes. So what's in astrocytes relative to all the other cells that that microarray study measured? And that helps reduce the impact of a lot of technical species and, and batch type bias. And the second was we used a, a rank statistic. And there's actually a method that I've used since and like a lot that's this poorly cited paper called a similarity score. And it does rank comparison between the gene lists. But what's nice about it, instead of spearmints, it but it um, weights higher having the same gene ranked towards the top of the list compared to in the middle. So if you think about experiments and two gene lists, genes ranked like the thousandth most expressed all the way to the 20,000th. There's not a lot of real difference there and that can contribute a lot of noise. So just by weighting this to what's, at, what's in the top of the list, it really helped uncover the biology amidst everything. And you can see how it worked here. I'm just starting with the main neural cell types, but this is oligodendrocytes, two different stages from that human RNA-seq study. The red is that mouse microarray study, and the black are predictions I made with my cell mapper algorithm using uh, non-isolated data from the Allen Brain Atlas. And you can see that they all agree quite well. You can see similarly the astrocyte uh, brains obtained by similar methods agree quite well. Same with the Schwann cells, and even if looking between cell types, it's fairly meaningful. Schwann cells are very functionally related to oligodendrocytes, and you see that's one of the cases where the two different cell types show some similarity in expression. So we included enterically on in this, and the green is the mouse RNA seq study I was involved in. The black are predictions I made with human gut data. Again, they came up with reasonably similar rank lists, and. One interesting thing is it's not that clear linked to any of the neural cell types. They're different from the non-neural controls we have, but they actually show some pathways in common with neurons, some in common with Schwann and oligodendrocytes, some in astrocytes. Now this partly might be heterogeneity, right? We, we suspect this cell class probably is very heterogeneous, but we were able to see by staining that you frequently would have markers and types of genes that in the central nervous system would be in very distinct cell populations co-expressed in the same cells in the gut. So the main kind of conclusion of this paper, I'm not sure who's going to get the Halloween David Pumpkin reference, but it's basically these were their own unique cell type. We couldn't really learn that much by trying to think they're just the astrocytes or the swan cells of the gut. So it's somewhat simple, but it was still a fun study to be involved in because it just helped really hook home. We're going to have to think about these and we want to understand what they do. And finally, briefly, my most experimental uh, project in grad school, I performed a targeted RNAi screen to identify genes that are involved with antibody transport across epithelial layers in the body. And a lot of the challenges here were really on robotics and cell culture, but the bioinformatics and computational biology still enabled this in many ways. For one, um, we uh, just due to challenge the cell line need to focus on a subset, and we did a screen of about 700 genes. And bioinformatics is how I got to that, comparing proteomic data to find genes expressed in the right organelle, 
to uh, cell mapper predictions for expressing the right cell type um, and different RNA screens for different species. And so integrating that data to come up with our targeted list was one way where take, leveraging the many available data was helpful. Also used mixed effects linear modeling to, to deal with systematic batching edge effects. So again, having gotten comfortable with R really helped enable getting cleaner uh, predictions from uh, the screen. So in the, the NELMS lab now, we tend to still have a combination of experiment and, uh, and analysis. I have three current PhD students and they range from I'd say about 5% computation on the low end to about 70% on top. Julian would be the 5% the example here and she's doing a lot of single cell RNA-seq work to understand genome activation in pollen. But even for a more uh, experimental biologist in the lab, it's a great opportunity to try to learn how to analyze your own data some. And for instance, with Julian, so I've mapped her data for her. It's fairly standard pipelines in the lab so that she's starting with the count matrix. But she's actually learning R. This is her first heat map she made two weeks ago and learning some ways between R and IGV to think about her own data and, and look at what's going on there. We have far more computationally advanced projects as well. And having this kind of blend, I think, is a, a fun feature as a PI, and it could be an interesting thing for a grad student. Lately, we've been doing a weekly bioinformatics working group, which is essentially kind of a office hours where who's ever interested will kind of at the beginning tell everyone else, here's what I'm working on today. And then I'll kind of go back and forth between the different lab members and help them with their code or whatever the challenge, how else could I plot the data? Um, and so that's that's been pretty successful and will probably continue. So most of what I did in grad school was in, you know, more biomedicine mammals. And now I'm in plant biology. And just real quickly, my, my motivation for this was largely big picture reason. I really wanted to work on something that could most impact people that are often left out of the benefits of many other types of technologies. And agriculture in particular is just really critical to a lot of things that impact humans and sometimes scales differently. And so I just found it being a really compelling problem to, to move to and devote the rest of my career to. And plant biology, even some of the very basic research we do can make a difference. Just to give you some, some examples here in the US, this is land planted for corn and total corn year yield we produce over time. You can see we've actually used less uh, land than we did 100 years ago, but despite that, we actually produce eight times as much corn. There's been consistent painstaking work by breeders, molecular biologists, and many different groups that have enabled this continued yield increase. And with climate change, we need ways to just keep this trend going while adapting to new climates, and we need ways to do it where we're using less water and chemicals in the process. And so it's just a... I think really important problem to be working on. And here's an example where it, it can be useful outside of the US type context. So one, one thing that I found really compelling as I moved to plant biology was learning about this example of sub one rice. So this is a, a gene that was introgressed from wild rice that's very flood tolerant. So we often think about you know, drought and climate change, but there are regions of the world where floods are really a big deal and it's only becoming worse, such as Bangladesh and some of the neighboring regions of India. And here's an example where a sub one intergress line, one farmer's growing it next to someone that had the equivalent line, but without that trade after a flood. And you can see how much better that performed in a, a, a real situation. And this is grown by millions of farmers and it actually came from marker assisted breeding early in the nineties when we could start to really sequence genome regions easier to finally identify what this was and make it an applied tool to farmers. So now to get to kind of my main topic for today, I'm gonna to share a little bit from one general thrust of our lab. And the goal here is to really change what we could do with cell fate reprogramming in plants, especially with applications that might impact breeding and genetics. You know, so I, I came from biomedicine and cell reprogramming, changing cell fate, it's amazing what has been accomplished in regenerative medicine over the last few decades. Um, you know, animal cells were once thought to be really locked in defined states, and now you can jump all around and, and do many kinds of transformations. 
And so when I moved to ag, it struck me that we actually have the same field in plant biology. It just has a different name. We call it plant tissue culture. So for instance, genetic transformation in essentially any crop, you get the DNA in a cell type that you can transform, but it's usually not something that will give rise to seeds or new plants. And so you have to actually reprogram those cells to regenerate. And it's using very similar processes to what we see in regenerative medicine. You're using hormones to induce changes in cell fate. You're using transcription factors and developmental regulators. And that's what actually is often the limiting step that controls which species we can transform, how easy it is, which lines we can transform. Some other examples are clonal propagation. Uh, for instance, when you get a potato in the supermarket, it's probably gone through tissue culture. And the reason is, is potatoes are very genetically complex. And if you save seed, it doesn't look anything like what you just grew. And traditionally, the way that's done is by propagating the tuber. You probably had a potato sit there too long and start sprouting. But in an industrial context, that creates lots of opportunities for pathogens to accumulate that cause big issues when you try to scale up. And so by going to tissue culture and transforming somatic cells through hormones to induce, to regenerate, you can actually do so under aseptic conditions and avoid this issue of pathogen accumulation while maintaining the same line. Some orchids have endemic viruses that are vertically transmitted through seeds and other plants. Tissue culture is a way that we've made virus free lines of those. Um, but there's even wilder things. A lot of plant species you can actually take the haploid meiotic products that would become pollen and induce them to become haploid plants. And then using drugs that cause the chromosomes to duplicate, you basically end up with a fully homozygous true breeding plant in under a year. It's been estimated in a, in a, um, that about half the barley cultivars grown in Europe have gone through this process at some point. That's one of the species where it's done the most. But again, this idea of changing, altering cell fate has a lot of power in plants that we grow and eat now. And I think a lot of potential in the future. One thing you might notice, the well, the techniques actually look very similar in terms of you know hormones, things like this. The applications are very different. Like we don't really care if one in 10,000 maize plants has a damaged leaf and we're not gonna do advanced tissue culture to try to regenerate that. In this case, where the cell reprogramming often is most impactful is when it lets us change the flow of information through the life cycle and rewire how, how genetics work. So the ultimate goal and the kind of pathways we want, want to induce are different, but I think we can learn a lot comparing the two between each other. So some examples of where this is going, a, a big improvement was has been made with transcription factors lately. Hormones have been the mainstay of plant tissue culture, but lately using developmental regulators like transcription factors and expressing them has made things like transformation work in species we could never do it before and lines we could never do it before. This is an example where two embryogenic TFs, Wuschel and Baby Boom, are used to create regeneration from a, uh, a maize leaf tissue that normally wouldn't regenerate. There's some wild ideas about how else we could do stuff. This little monstrosity of a stem growing out of this plant in culture is an idea where we can actually take similar types of embryogenic TFs and use in culture or even in soil and just induce that leaf cell to actually make a, a sprout that will have flower and make seeds, skip the whole tissue culture part altogether. There's a lot of farther ranging ideas. One in synthetic biology, being able to control plant form function for the many purposes we have for plants might be pretty powerful. Here's an example, tuning up expression in certain cell types of the right transcription factors allow the amount of side branching roots to change smoothly. So again, understanding these pathways, being able to induce new things, we might be able to really affect what, what we grow. Um, and there's some cool ideas like this concept of in vitro nurseries. What if we could do meiosis in a dish and then through artificial fusion or actually gamete formation, do cycles of crosses in very short time period and skip the field altogether, except uh, occasionally to grow up and see how we're doing in the process. You know, in this, I'll, I'll like to mention a lot of our stuff is um, we're really trying to develop processes to understand what we can do with developmental genes to induce changes in cell fate. But one of the specific examples that's kind of our, our white whale, one of the big lab goals is this idea of meiosis in a, in a dish. And it could enable a lot of approaches in genetics. One, it's really the key step that would enable this concept of in vitro nurseries to, to be feasible. 
Um, it would be another way to generate haploid plants. I mentioned that barley example, but there's many species where we don't have that. And this could maybe work on species where our current methods don't. And it allows us to manipulate recombination so much easier if that meiosis is happening in a dish, and we might be able to deal with linkage drag and induce very new changes in recombination for, for certain crosses. So today I'm gonna, you know, going forward, I'm gonna kind of give two vignettes. The first one from my postdoc, where we wanna be able to induce new cell fate programs. It's helpful to understand what's happening naturally. And so I've used single cell RNA seq to really follow natural developmental profiles. In this case, it will be looking at what's going on leading into meiosis. And then I'll talk a little bit about a um, newer project in our lab now where we're developing new kinds of high throughput functional genomic screens to identify, well, what can we reprogram? What can we induce using transcription factors and similar genes? So for meiosis, first, just to give you a little background, uh, maize is one of our main models. And part of the reason that got me this initially is for meiosis and pollen development, some of the reproductive pathways we study, it's just a really great organism to work with. You have about 5,000 anthers on a plant, and it gives you about a weak time course. Your most mature stages are here, earlier stages are gonna be out here. And so you can go to kind of defined places in the tassel and collect tissue from different stages. When you look at one of these individual flowers, you have three anthers and a floret, and they are tend to be fairly synchronized in terms of where they are in development, at least through meiosis, which could be really helpful because I can isolate cells from one of these and stage the others to have independent paired staging with any of my expression data. Also early on, the, the length of the anther is a very easy thing to, to measure, and it gives you a pretty good idea about what stage you might be in. So you can selectively choose to look around the beginning of meiosis, the middle, before meiosis, et cetera. And you don't need to remember this ruler, but the time course I'm gonna show you today is mostly this region right here. So just after my out of commitment, I followed what's going on during a bunch of mitotic amplifying divisions in the very beginning parts of meiotic prophase. So the actual meiotic cells, if you take a cross section of the anther, um, it has four lobes and each kind of looks like a bullseye. Right at the center of that are the cells that will go through meiosis and ultimately mature into to pollen. This is actually, these are actually tracings of, of cross section. And you see how big these four red cells are here compared to the surrounding. That's been a really helpful feature when specifically isolating these cells for our expression analysis. So what got me into thinking about single cell RNA-seq is in plants, we really don't know what the key genes are that induce the beginning of meiosis. We don't know the master regulator of meiotic entry. And a lot of these stages leading up to it, you know, what's going on during the amplifying divisions? How do you shift from a mitotic to a meiotic cell cycle in here? We don't even know what stages we might want to, to look at. What we have so far is we we have plenty of time courses with cell morphology, but that's relatively consistent through that entire week-long time frame I just told you about. And then chromosome cytology, which can be really powerful once you get into meiosis. Using the shape of the chromosomes, you can divide meiotic prophase one into nine different stages in, in maize easily without a super fancy microscope because of how big the chromosomes are and how much that's telling you about the kind of events going on. But before meiosis, it, it doesn't give us a whole lot. And that's where gene expression is another way that you can identify cell types. The idea is we might get resolution on sort of cell changes we weren't seeing by these more classic methods. You know, single cell and seq is just a, a very powerful technique for that. And the idea is essentially you isolate individual cells, you can compare expression between them and identify different classes over development. And it doesn't require any assumptions about our classic staging and how, how that might connect. So I developed methods to isolate meiotic cells from maize anthers. Here's an example of one of these traps. You'll sometimes hear me say the word protoplast. That's just a plant cell where the wall's been removed enzymatically. So it's just a cell. Here's an example of one of the pre-meiotic cells compared to the surrounding somatic cells. So you can see how easy they are to identify just based on size after disrupting the whole tissue. The way that I purify these is pretty old school. It's just by hand using a syringe needle on a simple microscope. Here's an example of purified enriched um, 
premiotic cells, and here's one of these cells put on the cap of a PCR tube in a little droplet of liquid. Here's a video of this process in action. So you can see here's two of the big cells that are just picked up with the needle. This is the kind of wash step of just going to a different place in the same slide, releasing the two cells there. And now I'll pick up one of those and add this to a PCR cap. So this takes about 30 to 40 seconds to sell, which really isn't that bad, actually. You can collect 200 cells in a two-hour period, and so you can get reasonable numbers with this type of, of technique. Here you can see the individual cell in the droplet. And some of the reasons, like, why go through all this work? Why the hand isolation? One is we can selectively isolate rare cells of interest, so we can just pick up the big cells and ignore the somatic cells unless we actually want to pick them up as controls for a question. It can handle large cells. These are actually too big to fit in 10X, so some of the standard platforms just wouldn't work. But two things I want to point out that are actually the biggest reasons we continue to use this in the, in the lab now. One is we can obtain independent stage information by microscopy, and the big part of that is miniaturization. By picking up by hand, we can take cells out of a single anther, pick them up, and then stain the remainder of them to see what stage that tissues in. We don't have to pool a lot together to get sufficient cell numbers to go into a 10X flow cell or a, a fax. And also because it's very easy to take smaller numbers of cells, we we'll often take eight from a sample and then stage it, we can do a lot of distinct samples. If you've read a lot of single cell, if there's time points in it, they might have done duplicate or triplicate of two or three time points. We'll collect time courses where we have a hundred very closely spaced time points because we can do small bits and have all that extra information. And that's really been powerful for some of our questions. One thing I'll mention too, the first time I did this, um, we actually did single cell technical replicates. So immediately after cell lysis, we split the lysate into two tubes and reverse transcription, all of library prep, all of the analysis could be done independently. And I'll just use this information a little bit in the slides to come to kind of show you how it's working. So here's a principal component analysis of the first time course I did. And this is about a week of development. So those prebiotic uh, divisions into the beginning of meiosis. Here's if I draw the two technical replicates together. So you can see they're consistently following next to each other on the principal components. And here's an example from a single cell of a split cell technical replicate. So this is a uh, molecular counting with UMIs. So what's reported here is one of the split cell replicates against the other, and you can see just how tightly correlated these data are. This is a lot different from most of the single cell data you may be used to seeing. We will can get 150 to 300,000 UMIs per cell in these experiments, and partly if you've seen a lot of other papers, you might be thinking 5,000, 10,000. A lot of that is just cell size. These cells are 45 microns across, which is much bigger. And the greater depth we have correlates pretty well with just cell volume. So we actually are working with a pretty nice biology to get clean data with these kind of experiments. If I color this by the tissue stage, it's measured by anther length. You can actually see that principal component one actually gives you a lot of information about tissue stage there. And so, you know, going back to my original question, a big part is, well, when are the stages leading to meiosis and how do we think about this? And, you know, one way we can set this up is, is clustering. In this case, you'll see some of the clusters look to be overlapping. That's because the clustering was done, including lower components that you can't visualize here. Um, but there are some challenges in this. When, when you look, there's a really big gap between this cluster four and five some of the others start to look a lot closer together. And the thing is, biologically, there's no reason to think that every cell phase transition is just gonna be you jump from stage A to stage B. Sometimes you're gonna walk between them. And so I'm just gonna highlight here, because this is a um, computational innovation that we made as part of the study. And that was to move to a more continuous way to define differences in, in cell state. So those who have thought about single cell analysis might be familiar with this concept of pseudo time. Essentially, you're trying to, it's dimensionality reduction with the idea that you're defining a coordinate that sort of reflects how cells are changing over time. The idea is that adjacent cells in development will be kind of similar in expression, so you can kind of infer that trajectory there. Pseudotime has a big advantage over a clustering type approach because 
it's continuous. You're not trying to define these arbitrary boundaries. But the downside is you don't actually get, well, what would the boundaries be in the first place? And so we just made a very simple uh, addition onto the pseudo time. And what we did there is if you actually order all these samples by pseudo time, you can see in pseudo time itself, you can see those gaps appearing, uh, uh, appearing. like some of these things that we might think, well, this is a bigger sh sharp transition as opposed to a smooth one. And so all we did is we fit a slope kind of with a rolling number of, of samples throughout and we can get curves like this, where we can see where is this continuous metric of pseudo time changing more rapidly or, or less rapidly. And because we have this um, individual metric, we can also use bootstrapping and try to assess, well, is this, are things changing more rapidly than the median or, or not right here? And this let us really consider where, where are the big changes without having to define cluster numbers themselves and without having to ignore the fact that some of these changes, there are differences from here to here. It's just not a big sudden jump. Here you can see this lined up over um, a large number of genes that had high variance in the data set. And you can kind of see what leads to a big jump in this pseudo time velocity metric. Right here, you can almost see a line going right up where all the samples look either like this stage or this stage. A lot of expression seems to be changing at, at once here. Um, here's some example individual genes to see the sort of patterns we see in the data. This little pink box I've kind of highlighted between these two peaks here, just so you can kind of draw your eye. You see a jump here with quite a few different genes, regardless of, of their pattern. And so that approach has let us really define here are stages that are, are changing quite dramatically. And in terms of how this is empowering our, our self aid reprogramming efforts, uh, there's a couple ways. We've expanded this time course. What I showed was the beginning of meiosis up to here. We now have through the entirety of pollen development after meiosis. Uh, value for meiosis in a dish. One, we can identify changes where a lot is happening rapidly. You know, one hypothesis might be this big jump, which you saw in a different form in the heat map on the other page. That might be a good stage to target if you want to induce some of these pathways ectopically. We also get... Um, we also have differential express genes that are occurring in different stages, and that can both help motivate candidate genes to test, as well as give you marker genes to know have you induced this pathway in the beginning. But the caveat, there's still a lot of candidates. If I even just consider the TFs that was like over fourfold differential expressed during this pathway, that's 27. Hundreds of TFs are expressed here. I'm not sure we should ignore cell cycle regulators and other classes of genes. And so we're still at kind of a large number and that's really motivated us to think about, well, how can we get to the empirical end too and make it so we can make larger numbers of predictions and see what they're, they're going, uh, whether they can induce things we want. And so that's led to this now NSF funded project where the goal is really to kind of develop and apply a new framework to explore what we can do with self aid reprogramming in plants with the core approach being not hormones in our case, but overexpressing different genes that especially transcription factors that might induce a new program. Uh, this is in collaboration with Kopi Cranus William, who's at NC State, and he's a fully computational biologist that does a lot of multi skill modeling and machine learning. He's helping with some very complex statistics uh, to deal with our screens as well as gene regulatory network inference. I'll talk about some of the bioinformatics parts that we're doing in, in the lab, as well as co-PI Wayne Parrott, who is an expert in plant tissue culture and transformation. And here's the team in, in the lab right now. A lot of what I'm talking about today is really all work driven heavily by a really talented grad student, Taylor Scroggs. So one thing to motivate, altering sulfate is not easy. Notice a lot of these arrows here have more than one gene listed. There's also sometimes removing a gene might be the thing we want to do. And even considering that, it gets combinatorially complex. But the source tissue matters. The media conditions matter. Um, how strongly you express these different genes and in relative to each other can all matter. So for instance, this example of transformation, this is uh, I gave a little bit ago where two TFs have now been used to really extend which species we can regenerate after transformation. And this has been called the holy grail of CO crop transformation because of how much it's enabled. But to accomplish this, it typically requires both TFs. So you're already getting to a really complex combinatorial space when you're thinking pairs 
but the promoter strength mattered. In practical situations, you need one of these TFs to have a weaker promoter in the other because that dosage really affects whether you regenerate in a productive manner. It's sensitive to the agrobacterium strain that you use to induce the TFs, and media conditions also had to be optimized to get this working. So very quickly, this is a very high dimensional space you're exploring to look for really rare events that work well. So how do you get past that? And we've looked a lot in the literature, both in plants and animals, and tried to think through what are our ways to focus our search to be more productive. And the big strategy we have, one, we're focusing as our key parameter we care the most about is on the TF or the regulatory gene. The idea is if we want to do really new things, finding that right gene to induce it's going to be the biggest hurdle beyond the media conditions and the others that you might be able to follow up on second. And the next is if we focus on the immediate response, this can actually really simplify our problem. One, by monitoring earlier events, instead of getting all the way through transformation and regeneration, we might be able to identify promising candidates, even if everything isn't worked out yet. And it's also often easier to establish short-term assays. So it might we can do higher numbers of TFs and genes to test. To give you an idea, here's with bushel and baby boom. If you transiently induce these, you can induce a response with one of the TFs without all that being optimized. Here's an example of an immature embryo uh, transformed with GFP. So you see a lot of the green specks here are different cells that are expressing GFP now. If you co-transform GFP with Wuschel, you get these protrusions. Wuschel actually helps organize the meristem, and you can see that the transformed cells are bringing along a whole kind of shoot-looking structure with it. With baby boom, you get heavy mitotic division stimulated. You see it looks a bit different than Wuschel. In this case, this is not that optimized promoter or agro strain or anything. This is just a constitutive strong promoter of the individual TS. So this wouldn't lead you to a productive transformation, but by looking seven days later, you can at least see that, hey, this is a TF worth following up going forward. And so our general strategy, we kind of go through three stages and each one gets, we start from very early response where we can do lots of genes and look for just that immediate response. And then we go successively to something that gets a little bit more practically relevant where we might have to think about all that complexity. So the first step, which I'll talk about briefly um, at the end of today, is setting up some high throughput transient assays where we can express different genes in isolated leaf primary cells and then measure everything that gets induced or repressed a short time later by RNA sequencing. From that, this is one area where bioinformatics is to be really critical. We can identify which of those induced responses that might be promising we want to improve regeneration or meiosis in a dish or other pathways. Then it goes to secondary screens for a physiological response. And to give you an idea on that, the images I showed you in the last page where Wuschel and baby boom could induce cell divisions, that's exactly the assay we're using to find additional regeneration-inducing candidates. And we're adapting similar concepts of assays for meiosis and for, for other pathways here. So this step, it's still, we're thinking shorter term, like seven day, 14 day assays, uh, usually a microscopy readout, um, this is going to depend on the pathway we care about. Like the thing we're doing for meiosis is going to be a little different than what we do for regeneration. The first step is actually quite cool, given it's so much work. It's pathway agnostic because we're measuring everything induced or repressed. It could be useful to prioritize all kinds of pathways we're thinking about and ones that the community might care about that's beyond us. And finally, the last stage is where you get into the, all of the complexity of having to optimize combos, promoters, but trying to get to a productive pathway here. So I'm going to just talk about this part now. This is really the core of the project. And so essentially what our initial screening assay is, we take primary maize, maize seedling cells and isolate protoplasts. So again, just the cells without the wall. Uh, we overexpress candidate transcription factors using robotics. And we set this up so that we have these assays going on 3D4 old plates and we can do many, many different uh, genes. And then finally, we measure the full transcriptional response by RNA sequencing. And the RNA-seq libraries were adapted directly from what I've used in the past for single-cell RNA-seq. It's bulkier, but some of the things that allow libraries to be produced many-fold over and cheaply have really helped enable this kind of screen here. To give you an example of one of our plate layouts, we're using um, a, a design that came out of you know, stuff I learned when I was doing RNAi screens, but 
statistical considerations to make sure you have controls well distributed so you can deal with edge and different batch effects. The outer edges are left blank because they tend are just with liquid because they tend to have the strongest edge effects. Each of the red dots here are a control well where we express the amateur fluorescent protein. This is both a um, positive control, so we can see that the transformation worked, and a negative control for the RNA sequencing because we're strongly expressing a gene, but it shouldn't downstream induce anything else. And to give you an idea of a picture from one of these assays, here's an example from one plate, and we can quantify the amount of fluorescence in all of these to measure transformation efficiency. And we've gotten pretty reproducible transformation efficiency between days, different parts of the plate. Here's two examples from last year. We were uh, averaging about 75% of the cells transformed. This has actually gone up to about 85 to 90%. And I can't tell you why. There's been improvements that got us here consistently. The only thing that's happened since there is Taylor's had a year more of experience, and she's gotten better. And sometimes you can't explain it, but we actually keep continuing the more she does this. Um, so to give you an example of where we're at right now, and this is very much a work in progress with the RNA-seq, we've done a pilot assay where we tried 164 different transcription factors in duplicate. So a single 384 oil plate, we had two positions for each TF plasmid, and then we had 24 controls. So that's all those red positions you just saw on the previous page. Our alignment rate's pretty low. Uh, we generally get fairly low alignment rates from these, these assays. Most of the unaligned are actually ribosomal. Uh, there's a poly-A selection, but it's not, uh, or poly-A priming, but it's not perfect. And a lot of stuff comes through, which we can include sequencing. And when looking at the unaligned from this assay, it still seems to be almost all ribosomal. Uh, this is still lower. The single cell stuff I showed you, that's like 50%. And we've done different single cell and different species and it ranged from 30 to 70%. So this was a little bit of something we've been thinking about. Uh, we were getting about 30,000 UMIs per well, 8,000 genes detected per well. Again, this is okay. This is worse than a lot of meiotic single cell stuff. And so here's some example scatter plots. These are biological replicates, not technical replicates. You know, if you compare that to the split single cell, we're, we are hoping to do a bit better. What we have now we can use, but I just want to point out that this has been a continually optimized type of assay. One thing, for instance, we found is that a freestall step we had was actually causing a big issue with RNA degradation. We freestall our single cells. We hadn't tested that very specifically, but when getting our first pass data <laughs> and coming back and being like, we want better than this, this is something we noticed pretty quickly on. And it really, we could isolate it down to the thawing on ice step is when it would happen. Uh, thinking through a couple things, what we finally found is that um, if we freeze in a pH2 lysis buffer, whatever the RNA is that's causing us issues seems not to be active, and we can thaw and get great quality RNA. And because this buff, this um, pH2 is very low buffered, it's very easy to move the pH back up when we start doing enzymatic steps. We have some uh, sequencing data now that we made this improvement. The alignment rate's gone up quite a bit. We're a bit more happy with. Um, roughly double the number of UMIs per well and increased number of genes. This is actually slightly lower sequencing depth. One thing at the moment, we're just not much over one read per UMI. Um, and I generally like to put this number closer to five. That's where you can really start to mitigate some PCR type amplification bias, but there's more complexity in these libraries. So sequencing deeper, we'll also continue to get these numbers up. So this is where we are now. We're starting to move forward. The data I'm talking about is kind of our, our version one of, of the libraries. So here's an example of a transcription factor that didn't seem to induce anything when we tested it. What I'm plotting on each dot is a gene. On the x-axis, this is the mean transcripts per million among all of those control samples. On the y-axis, this is the mean transcripts per million in two duplicates that overexpress this TF, RFTF31. You know, there's some spread here, but nothing that makes us think something major has changed. Compare this to, to another TF that we expressed here, the, the two replicates plot against the same controls. You see it's a much larger spread and everything highlighted in red here are statistically significant with kind of an early pass uh, statistics that we're doing. Um, 
And so we get some of both. It's been roughly half of the genes are actually inducing a strong response, which is honestly more than I expected. The chance of inducing something new, um, I didn't know where hit rate would be on that because we're monitoring all the pathways. I'm expecting higher than a typical genetic screen, but I didn't know I was expecting 50%, but that's kind of where we're at, even with the noisy data, which is kind of cool. Here's a heat map showing a couple examples. This first one, these are the two replicates from this G2 transcription factor I just showed you. Here's the two duplicates for four other transcription factors, the negative controls. So you can see many different TFs are inducing distinct and reproducible pathways. And another thing that was pretty cool is it's really, there's not a lot of sign that any of these TFs that upregulate stuff are doing the same thing. There's a clear TF specific signal again and again, where you might have some genes up induced by multiple, but overall you could clearly identify if you pick a new sample and want to tell me which of these TFs it belong to, you wouldn't have much trouble doing that. So, and again, roughly 75 of the TFs we're showing at least one gene induced to our statistical significance. Our current stats are sort of a temporary version because when we have four replicates, like we're ultimately planning cleaner data, we're, it's going to be a very different approach that we'll be able to use. But at least on our baseline, a lot of ways that we cut this, it's roughly half the genes seem to be having a clear effect. So we're testing a really large set. We're going through a, a group of 2,000 cloned TFs. It's about two-thirds of all predicted maze transcription factors. It also includes some other chromatin regulators that can induce specific pathways beyond just sequence-specific DNA binding. And we're testing a smaller number, but one I'm kind of excited about that have been contributed by the community, where others, particularly in the maze community, are like, oh, this isn't in the clone set, but I cloned it. Could you test these five? And those are going to be cool just because they're of immediate interest already, and so it's going to make the resource that much more valuable. The first set of data we're expecting probably by the end of this year, we have 850 TFs that have been recloned into our expression vector and prepped. So they're ready to screen as long as we're comfortable with our final library prep. Um, and then we're gonna continue moving through the, the full set. So one thing is, you know, you induce these many different genes, but what does that mean? Is this good for meiosis or for regeneration or for something else? And, you know, there's some of the classic approaches like go term, like gene enrichment analysis, but that's good for a couple pathways. There's a whole lot where it's not the best. And so what we've taken is a, a different strategy to prioritize some of these TS based on their data. And that's to compare what we've induced to what we've seen before using publicly available experiments. So I have a time force on meiosis. Do any of the TS induce the same genes that are normally upregulated early in meiosis? Um, an example I'll give you for regeneration, here's a study uh, that did transcriptome profiling uh, early in a hormone-based way to induce somatic embryogenesis. And so essentially what we do is we look at the genes induced by each TF one by one, and we compare that to the genes upregulated during the first 24 hours of somatic embryogenesis, and we see is this enriched. Here's an example of from RTFs. It's remember we screened 164, one of them both replicates failed, so that's where that's missing. But we found seven transcription factors that significantly were enriched for genes normally seen during somatic embryogenesis. This top rank one, IAA is a family that generally is involved in auxin response. One of the hormones used was auxin. So it makes sense we might see that. I don't know if this is just telling us you're inducing auxin to things or if it actually might be useful, but it's a reasonable candidate to get probably the one that excited me the most to see because we just picked random TFs that we cloned first. We weren't intentionally selecting things for regeneration or anything else in our first pass pilot. It's this third rank one, which is knotted one. It's a key meristem gene in maize. And incidentally, it's the direct homologue of one of the two genes that were used to make this monstrosity over here. So this is giving us a clear sign that we might have a real way to take this high throughput proto data and identify reasonable candidates to go further in our pipeline for testing. I've also tried this with some of my data, nothing promising for meiosis yet. Um, we did find one candidate that was upregulated for a lot of pollen genes, and it's a potential ortholog for a key pollen developmental transcription factor in Arabidopsis, so it was cool to see that one pop up here. Um, but to give some ideas of some bioinformatics projects that might be available in the lab, 
One would be to take that process I, I just showed you. We've done a very first pass, but really making sure we're comparing to other expression data the best way possible to motivate really clear candidates. It's going to take more thought than what we've done so far, as well as implementing it in practice. So we're getting all this data coming in. Which genes should we focus on next and helping to prioritize those and develop processes for that? Others would be to investigate things that might impact what we can induce in these protoplast assays. You know, for one, there's a lot of other genomic data we can compare to to think about how does genomic accessibility impact whether a gene can be induced? You know, do, do closed regions in protoplast, are we actually still able to induce them when we express transcription factors here? A lot of differentiation reprogramming is thought to require going through the cell cycle so you can reset epigenetic modifications. There's no cell divisions in our assays, yet we're still inducing a lot of distinct responses. So is it only a subset of genes we're sensitive to? What might define whether it could be induced? Are transcription factors tending to induce genes expressed in the same tissue that the TF themselves are found to? Um, you know, how often do we see TFs that are already expressed in the leaf cells? Do those tend to do nothing because they're already there? Or when we drive them to high level, are we still getting new pathways and sensitive to their functions? So you get the general trend. There's a lot we can do to explore these data and learn a little bit more about what we can do with ecotopic expression. You know, there's also a lot of room to get further with the meiotic data we already have and better prioritize some things we might want to focus on, given that's one of our favorite pathways to induce. You know, and there's there's other projects. So this is mostly I've talked about our NSF funded work. We have uh, NIH funding where we're thinking more about accumulation persistence of new mutations, germline establishment, often using pollen development as a model. But some examples, we're collecting a lot of single cell data to understand genome activation in pollen. And in plants, pollen is actually expressing most of its genome from the haploid, uh, from the haploid phase. And here, this is a single maze pollen grain from F1 and the RNA-seq data, you can immediately see the segregation of alleles. And this way we can distinguish, is this from the haploid genome or is it a pre-existing transcript to study genome activation? There's a lot of analysis things where we can push these data further. We're developing ways to do haploid genetic screens in pollen. Here's the example of a starch synthesis gene staining where half are muted for this pathway, half aren't. And we're developing new kinds of genetic screens we can do cool. So if anyone's familiar with like bacterial TNC or the, the yeast insertion type screens, we're trying to set up ways to do this in plants using pollen. And then thinking about kind of statistics about how different developmental strategies can impact when a mutation, uh, a new mutation only spreads for a little bit or uh, spreads far throughout the organism. So pretty rushed to get into some of the big concepts here, but basically a range of things thinking about genetics where we're using genomics as a tool. And there's a lot of potential for bioinformatics heavy projects. So with that, I'd like to thank the lab. A lot of the TF screen work is really at every stage been done by hard work from Taylor right here. Um, the other grad students in the lab are Justin Shulin and Sue Lee's newly joined as a tissue culture expert to help with those secondary screens for the reprogramming. Um, we have our collaborators. The first project was done while I was a postdoc uh, with Virginia Walba at Stanford. And I left less time for questions than I meant, but I'll take some questions now. Hi, uh, really interesting talk. My question is related to um, the number of uh, transcription factors that you would expect to be related to meiosis out of the 2,400-ish um, that you are planning to test. I'm a little surprised that you identified five out of 163 to be significantly related to meiosis. The, the, it was seven for the graph you're thinking. That wasn't meiosis. That was for regeneration. And I think one reason that had a high uh, hit rate when comparing to that pathway is just one, there might be a lot of things involved in inducing development. It's also a the experiment we're comparing to used hormones. So I think any genes inducing those kind of hormone responses, I think there's a lot of pathways we might be seeing all together in that uh, we actually don't have any yet that are clearly inducing the early meiosis ones. So we're hoping to, to find those, but we haven't yet. 
So for your single uh, single zero RNA I, I can't say clearly, but I think that there's a product. Uh, the RNA velocity versus the pseudo time. So there's a big junk. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, happened? That, like, do you know it happened that within a single cell cycle? Or it's because uh, I mean. Yeah. So the um. Yeah, so just pull, pulling that up here. So one thing, too, because there is a, a technique, RNA velocity, that's a very different type of analysis was single cell data. The pseudo time velocity is this, this one here. We're just trying to look at, is there a lot of expression change over time? And this big gap here, uh, because we have independent staging information, we actually know a lot about when in meiosis this occurs, and it's within a cell cycle. This um, is actually quite interesting. It splits a classic meiotic stage and prophase one, we can divide into nine. It splits one of these in two. There are cells in leptotene where half of them are in this area, half of them are in this area. And so again, they correlate perfectly in terms of like later on this is also later when we look at cytology, but the way you find stage boundaries looks different when you're considering a different aspect of of cell biology. So this isn't one that is easy to see based on the chromosome cytology. How do you define the pseudo time of velocity? Because I know the RNA velocity is based on the splice on splice, but what, what is exactly the pseudo time? Yeah, so basically pseudo time velocity, it's just a simple extension built on pseudo time where we order all the cells by pseudo time and then take the slope. Okay. So it's just a way to quantify how quickly is pseudo time changing. Okay. Um, so that's what the pseudo time velocity is. It was a way to account for things like this big jump and, and quantify it more clearly. Okay, thank you. I might miss something, but like, uh, yeah, yeah. Through the pseudo time analysis, like you can see like the, like, uh, how the cell development but like, have you ever checked the marker genes like about the cycle, like mitosis, like that the transcript vector you screen or like already known marker genes like that clean genes, you know, in, in your yeah. single cell RNA thing? So cell, cell cycle stuff, that, that's one yeah. cool thing about these data. So I showed this set of 3000 something genes, but there's actually a small class that looks very different. So this is the same sample order with pseudo time, and these you see jumps. This one's got it, this one isn't. But what, what you're actually looking at is cell cycle expression. This is the transient amplifying divisions, which are asynchronous. And so you have some cells in one phase or another. If I take if I take all the genes and do uh, PCA, I get something very similar to what you saw. What I did show you was excluding these cell cycle genes, but they're such a small portion that it doesn't drastically change it. But look what happens when I just make a PCA on those genes, I get this beautiful, <laughs> nice cycling graph that you can link to the different stages in the, the cell cycle here. And the predictions from this actually fit, at least for S phase where we have measurements quite well to percentages at, at different time there. And that's an advantage of single cell. A lot of genes, if you look at differential expression from this stage to this stage, it's actually just telling you changes, relative changes in cell cycle proportions. It also means we have cell cycle phase specific information for the cells that are about to do meiosis but are still in mitosis. So you couldn't have a more matched mitotic sample than that. And again, I mentioned there's a lot of room to explore these data more. This is one of the areas we're comparing that mitotic to meiotic expression can be quite interesting. I mean, maybe one thing I'll show you on this, and this, this is in main text in the paper. But here's the absolute correlation with the most similar cell cycle cluster. So the average expression across cell cycle clusters, how much does each gene correlate? And on the y-axis is the same thing, but now correlated with pseudotype. So it's, it's this kind of fitting the general developmental projection trajectory. And you can see there's actually not much up here. It tends to, you know, stuff down here is just can be low express, noisy, but the ones that are going up, they either tend to correlate with cell cycle or with pseudo time and the developmental trajectory. And that is even in things like the, the cyclins here, which gives us kind of some interesting candidates, even more than the two cyclins that are going up, there's two cyclin D classes that are pretty much constituently expressed all during the mitotic divisions. You can see some variation here. The expression is fairly low. That's mostly consistent with counting error. And then they just go down 
the moment you're at meiotic S phase, which is the first time you're really seeing meiosis specific things. And when you saw the pseudotime velocity here, this is not, uh, well, these are ordered differently, but the jump from the mitotic stage to meiotic is not a particularly large change in expression overall. So it's really cool to see these cycling genes going down. Maybe they need to be shut off to convert them from mitotic to meiotic cycle. Oh, I see the, the time is up in the class. Uh, the people waiting outside. And, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.